Thank you to H.R. Hoffman for suggesting this Patreon raffle review, which was honestly a long time coming. I promised that this would come out back when? In 2021? But hey, the title and premise may be different, but here it is. Not too many people know this, but my favorite series of classic cartoons has been Popeye for the longest time. The high-paced energy, the voice provided by Jack Mercer, it's just all great. That is, until things started to change. Much like the other cartoons of his day, Popeye went through some noticeable changes in the late 40s and the entire 1950s. None of them were for the best. Let me tell you all about them. This is the painful demise of theatrical Popeye. In the late 30s, the production company that produced Popeye, Fleischer Studios, was going through some experimental phases, let's just say. They relocated from New York City to Florida to pursue feature films, but unfortunately, after just two, they were about ready to close up shop. Paramount, who'd been investing heavily into their feature film pursuits, decided to buy them up, kick the Fleischer brothers out of the studio, which was honestly okay because they weren't on speaking terms anyways, and decided to start from scratch. Many of their other series, like Little Lulu or Superman, were still doing quite well, but Popeye was still the cash cow. Sometimes his cartoons would gross higher than those of, say, Mickey Mouse or Bugs Bunny. Though to be fair, Bugs Bunny was far from the mascot that he would later become at this time, but still it's rather impressive. So in 1941, the deal was complete. The studio was officially renamed to Famous Studios, and for the most part, the original crew was kept on. While the Fleischer brothers were gone, some of the most influential crew members from Fleischer like Sam Bushwald, Isidore Sparber, and Seymour Needle were kept on board. Not only that, but they were the ones in charge. This way, Popeye could continue the streak it was going on without having the Fleischer brothers anywhere near the studio. They were so eager to get rid of the memories of all things Fleischer that Max Fleischer's name was removed from the beginning credits in every Popeye cartoon. Famous Studios wasn't exactly able to have the best start with the public, since right around the time they were starting to produce Popeye cartoons of their own, the United States had officially entered World War II. As with the other major American animation studios, Famous Studios began to create propaganda cartoons, starting off with their very first Popeye entry, the now infamous You're a Sap, Mr. Jap. In these shorts, Popeye would join the Navy and hijinks would ensue. Also fun fact, because of these shorts, Popeye would stay in the Navy throughout the rest of his theatrical run. It does go without saying that Famous Studios was working with a far lower budget than their predecessors did, and during this time the economy was just now starting to come out of the depression, but even so, Famous Studios largely was able to do a lot with the little they had. Even though contemporary views on the wartime cartoon seem to be split, for, you know, obvious reasons, many people consider them, at least in terms of quality, to be relatively close to the cartoons that came before. This is of course despite the tight budget, rigid deadlines, and the fact that Popeye's voice actor Jack Mercer was drafted into the Navy, Popeye was able to retain his popularity up until the end of the war. When the war was over, Popeye had to adapt. The style of cartoons that were made in the 1930s was starting to grow stale. The new Warner Brothers cartoons began to hit the scene, they were full of similarly fast-paced wacky jokes, but the delivery tended to change. Naturally, Popeye was up to the task, but not before making some changes to the series. Olive Oil's design would get a stylistic overhaul, fitting more in terms of what was popular at the time. Once again, Popeye would stay in his Navy uniform, but perhaps the most noticeable change was the lack of reliance on characters from the Thimble Theater comics. It wouldn't be as noticeable at first, but as time went on, characters like Pappy, Sweepy, or even Wimpy would begin to disappear. Part of the reason was because Popeye's popularity was starting to dip. Now, he wasn't in dire straits or anything, but Famous Studios' revenue was going down. Now, it seems to be debated as to whether this was because Famous Studios wasn't able to pay royalties to King Features Syndicate for these characters, or because having only a core cast of three characters, plus Popeye's occasionally appearing nephews, would be considerably cheaper. I wouldn't have trouble believing either one. 
With the cost to produce each Popeye cartoon staying the same, but with revenues going down, some more changes had to be made in order to keep the series going, like cutting the animation budget. This resulted in not exactly bad animation, but animation that was slower and overall more low energy. Which is of course exactly what Popeye should not be. It got so bad that by the late 40s and early 50s, they had to start using stock music and sound effects to get by. But things only began to get worse for famous studios. A round of layoffs meant that the Popeye cartoons now had to be made with a smaller team, but the deadlines would remain the same. Naturally, this meant in terms of both finances and time, the crew could no longer afford to make the cartoons as high-spirited as they once were. In order to get by, the Popeye cartoons began to change focus. The Popeye cartoons would now largely focus on the love triangle between Popeye, Olive Oil, and Bluto. Not only that, but they would be the same cartoon almost every time. More often than not, the formula went like this. Popeye and Bluto are in love with Olive Oil. Olive Oil likes Popeye better. The two compete. Bluto decides that he's had enough with competing and decides to take Olive for himself. Popeye looks like he's beaten. Chomp Chomp goes to spinach. Popeye attacks Bluto and wins. Then all's well that ends well until the next six minute adventure where they do the same thing over and over again, just with a different setting. Honestly, thinking back to them, the only reasons I can set these cartoons apart is because of the gimmick they use in each one. There's one where Popeye and Bluto play pranks on each other on April Fool's Day. There's one where Bluto pretends to be a radio star to woo Olive Oil. There's one where Bluto's the strongest man in the world at a circus. You get the point. Now the characters disappearing was one thing, but the original plots disappearing? That was something else. Famous studios would begin to go back and not exactly remake old cartoons from the Popeye series, but recycle the same stories. They would be basically the same, but with slower gags and worse animation. When you're working with fewer characters, you're naturally going to have a hard time coming up with stories. So while technically it makes sense for Popeye to be remaking some of his old cartoons, it also showed that the present condition of the series was not viable for longevity. Warning signs were starting to pop up. If the story wells were running this dry already, what was going to happen later on? Well, Famous Studios decided to press on and find out. Things began to get worse in 1951. Bushwald died of a heart attack, leaving his two colleagues all alone. By this time, Famous Studios was in big trouble. Not only were the box office numbers going down, but on the rise was the arch enemy of theaters everywhere, good old television, meaning that their core audience was less willing to pay for tickets and instead decided to watch whatever was on in the privacy of their own home. More layoffs began and the crew was stretched even thinner than they were before. And this began to show in the cartoons. Gags would now take their time. Whether it be a pop culture reference, dialogue-based joke, or an animation gag, to make up for the lack of quality and quantity for these jokes, they would instead just make them bigger so that there would appear to be bigger laughs. But at the time, audiences didn't buy it. Animation historians also note that around the early 50s, the Popeye cartoons began to pander a bit more towards families instead of adults. While Popeye would never exactly lose his adult edge, Famous Studios was trying as hard as they could to make these cartoons enticing to kids, so that way, the adults, you know, the ones who control the money of the family, would be more enticed to go out and watch the cartoons. And hey, bringing a kid along with him means an extra ticket. And that means more money. But that didn't work. Instead of attracting families, Popeye only alienated the crowds further. Though it must be said that the budget issues and the lack of attendance was not just a Popeye issue. This was also happening to the like of, say, Looney Tunes and Hanna-Barbera. Many consider the best option being to just close down shop and move on. But Famous Studios wanted to get that old Popeye popularity back. He used to be as big as Mickey Mouse. If they tried just a little harder, maybe they could get that status to come back. But it didn't work. Ideas were starting to dry up, and now gags were being recycled from short to short. The whole mess of Popeye in the 1950s can be boiled down to this simple cycle. Fewer people would come, famous studios would lay more people off, the deadline became tighter and the budget became lower, the writing and gags were heavily downgraded, the cartoon would be released, then people wouldn't like it. 
This, of course, causes fewer people to come to the next cartoons, causing things to just spiral out of control. By 1956, famous studios had lost all confidence in Popeye. Isidore Sparber ended up leaving right as they changed their name to Paramount Cartoon Studios, and this last year of Popeye cartoons is usually considered the worst. Same old bad jokes, same old bad animation, but somehow even worse. As I'm sure many of you expected, this was not able to save the series. The final theatrical Popeye cartoon, Spooky Swabs, was released on August 9th, 1957. Then after that, Popeye was done. At least in terms of the theater market. Quickly after Famous Studios stopped production of Popeye and, well, all other theatrical cartoons, every Popeye short was sold to syndication, meaning that they were now available on TV, their main rival in the first place, causing Popeye to once again become as popular as he used to be back in the day. Whether it was the old Fleischer cartoons of the 1930s or the slow and boring cartoons of the Famous era, kids didn't care. They just wanted more Popeye. So, it's funny. Famous Studios tried as hard as they could to kick TV's butt, only to turn around and go right back to TV once they died. Why do you think that was? Well, at least in my perception, they just couldn't get with the times. No matter how bad things got, they had to stick with what they knew. Granted, this move was not entirely unjustified, considering that at the time, Television animation had next to no budget whatsoever, so Popeye wouldn't exactly be able to have his rip-roaring adventures that he used to have on the small screen, but even so, there comes a time where you have to do your third round of layoffs, and people are telling you that they need to push the deadline back, and you have to think to yourself, is this really worth it? I think Famous Studios' desperation to bring Popeye back into the spotlight shows best when it came to how they treated their workers. Remember, they kept laying people off year after year, the budgets would be slashed every single year, but the quotas and deadlines remained the same. Corners had to be cut, people had to be overworked, and the reason they did this was because they had to get some cartoon, any cartoon, to get out there in theaters and get people excited, never once realizing that they should have gone for quality over quantity. I mentioned that a little bit earlier, didn't I? If they decided to release fewer Popeye cartoons each year, sure, they still would have hurt financially, but the Popeye reputation wouldn't have sunk as low as it did during the late Famous era. And when Popeye did come back into theaters, it would be a big event. Not big enough to save Famous, but at least big enough to keep them afloat at least a little longer. While I wouldn't say that the later Famous stuff is bad, it's certainly not the Popeye we know and love. But if you think that Popeye's hardships ended here, nope. Things got way worse with the Gene Deitch cartoons on TV. And even though I like it, the 1980 movie didn't exactly do the franchise any favors. But those, my friends, are tales for another day. Well, folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? Have you seen the Famous Studios cartoons before? If so, what are your thoughts? The only one I can really say I like is the one where Popeye and Bluto have a restaurant and they're trying to get Wimpy, who made one of his seldom appearances, to be their one customer. It's slow and it's kind of dull overall, but I don't know, it's charming enough. But yeah, if you want to see the change in pace between the old Popeye and the new Popeye, that's the one to see. Anyways, comment below and let me know because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. Okay, before we get to the outro real quick, it's time for a fan art shout out. It's been, what, a year since we've done one of these? But hey, it's good to finally come back. Jeraminx created this, and man, I love it. I love that one of the eyes is kind of like drifting away and, you know, kind of captures some of the manic expression that my weird little avatar has. The little cozy stance, but also the fact that I could snap in a moment. I smiled when I first got this. It doesn't happen very often, but every time I get fan art like this, it makes my day. And now, guess what? It's that time again. That time to thank our wonderful Patreon people, starting with our Masters of Fate. Channel 11, 
Drew the Stew, Kev Messick, Platinum Bass, Quiet Chap, Ryan Williams, Timey, Toko Blahuvian, and Woody Woo. And now for our executive producers, Albert Robinson, Blackjack, H.R. Hoffman, Indiscreet One, Kurt Bruenning, Leaf Storm, Ravioli Supremo, Unkale, and who else but Zane? If you two would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then why not consider donating to the Patreon? There's a link in the description below for you to check out. Also, there's a link to the Media Mementos Twitter and Discord server, so stop on by and say hello. Alright folks, thanks for watching the video, and I'll see you guys next time.